Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Refrigerant Checkup. Uh, following up on my last episode last week when I talked about GWP values and how they're calculated, I've asked one of my colleagues, Stephanie Kopchek, to come on with us and talk a little bit about how GWPs are being used to shape refrigerant regulations around the world. So welcome, Stephanie. Uh, why don't you start off by taking a minute to uh, introduce yourself and tell everyone what you do and what you've been working on. Hi, Chuck. Sure. Thanks for having me today. Uh, as you said, my name is Stephanie Kopchik. I'm the global market manager for our stationary refrigerants business. And in my role, I've been in this role for about three years now. Uh, I work with our global customers and partners and all of our teams in the regions uh, on the development and commercialization and use of our Option refrigerants. So glad to be here again, and hopefully I'll be able to help answer some questions for you, Chuck. Thanks, Stephanie. Why don't we get right into it, and maybe you can comment on a, a phrase we hear talked about quite a bit, but it's that of an HFC phase down, and how that differs from a phase out that we were familiar with uh, with dealing with some of our older refrigerants like R12 or R22. Sure, Chuck. So in order to explain what the HFC phase down means and how that's different from a phase out, I'll just briefly explain uh, the ozone depleting phase out, right? Like you referenced the R12 and the R22. The key with a phase out of ozone depleting substances was that regulators looked at the volume of production or import into the country and they stepped that down over time to get to zero. Um, and so it was volume based uh, on production and it went to zero. Uh, the difference with the HFC phase down is that you're not just looking strictly at a volume of HFCs, you're looking at the volume weighted with the global warming potential of that HFC and then you're trying to phase down from there. And also, the HFC phase down, uh, as agreed to through the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, never actually gets to zero. It gets to 15 to 20 percent of the individual country's baselines. So it's an acknowledgement that HFCs are needed for the future uh, in a certain amount, uh, but that it's important to try to drive to as low a GWP as you can get. And so that can be done by using a variety of different solutions, including blending HFCs with HFOs and other materials in order to drive to lower GWP. So let's walk through what that HFC phase down structure looks like. Uh, and I think that'll give a better understanding for uh, folks on the line. Okay, so if we look at this example, this is a generic country A. Uh, and country A looks like they consumed on average in their baseline years uh, about 10,000 tons of HFCs. And if you just assume that the HFCs that they consumed were about 50% 410A, 25% 404A, and 25% 134A with those GWPs, you can then calculate what the CO2 equivalent ton baseline is, which is each of the volumes times the GWPs. Okay, So you can see that in country A, their baseline for CO2 equivalent tons is 23.5 million. So then what you need to do is take that baseline and start stepping down from there. So it's not a strict volume reduction, it's a GWP weighted tonnage. And so what that does is the market still needs the volume of refrigerants that it needs. Certainly reductions can be made in leaks, in smaller charge sizes, etc. But in general, the HVAC industry still needs to continue to uh, meet the cooling needs that it has. So what you can do is you, when you transition to lower GWP products, you effectively phase down and reduce the amount of CO2 equivalent consumption that you have. So just in this example, let's take this further. Um, if you had the ability to reduce your 134A consumption and drive it to zero uh, because 1234YF um, is an HFO and it's not counted in the quota, 
you could take those three and a half million CO2 tons out of the market over time. Uh, in addition, if you take the 404A volume and you replace all of that over time with something with a GWP of 1500, which is about a 70% reduction, you can cut out almost 7 million CO2 equivalent tons. So if you do just those two things over a period of time, you can get to a 40% reduction from your baseline years. And so when we talk about an HFC phase down, that's really what we're referring to, is that eventually, as part of the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, countries around the world agreed that they would get down to 15 to 20 percent of their original baseline consumption on a CO2 equivalent basis. They can do that in a variety of ways. Each country needs to set up their own regulation to get there. Um, but this is the basic concept, is that you're not slashing volumes per se. You can use equivalent volumes or similar volumes, but you the volume you use is weighted by a lower GWP solution. So hopefully that's helpful, Chuck. Uh, back to you. Okay, great. I think it might be helpful if you could explain how a particular region or country is shaping regulations uh, to implement an HFC phase down, particularly how it could impact or how people could prepare their businesses uh, for that type of regulation. Yeah, so I think a good place to start is to take at Europe and look at their FGAS regulations, which took effect as of January 1st, 2015. And what you'll see with the European regulations here is that they actually take uh, a few different approaches. They have both a CO2 cap and reduction, as well as GWP limits or bright lines uh, for select new equipment applications, as well as for service ban. Um, and one thing you'll notice also with the European Union's regulation is that reclaimed and recycled refrigerants uh, as well as pure HFOs are excluded from the GWP counting. Um, so what you see with the HFC phase down is that every three years there is a reduction in the total CO2 equivalent tons that are allowed in the market. Um, but again, that doesn't necessarily mean there is a reduction in the total volume in the market. It just means that the types of refrigerants that people are selecting and using uh, are going to be lower global warming potential. Uh, and then certainly in order to drive and make sure that the industry is transitioning um, at a certain pace, the equipment bans also set a standard for uh, what GWP limits are required for new equipment. Uh, and then the service ban also addresses some of the higher GWP refrigerants used in uh, refrigeration equipment to make sure that those don't continue to get serviced with new product for uh, an extensive period of time. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, can you give us some examples from countries uh, around the world that are dealing with these issues? Yeah, so for example, so far in Japan, uh, the regulators have implemented a series of GWP bright lines or limits by application uh, for new equipment sales, and that's what's being implemented in Japan at this time. Uh, in Australia, for example, they're taking a different approach where there are no bright lines yet uh, for GWP restrictions, and instead they are just doing the phase down on a CO2 equivalent ton basis and they are taking an even approach of stepping down every two years a certain amount and they're ensuring that they hit the milestone years that Kigali requires but they're taking their own approach instead of having larger step downs in fewer years every two years Australia has smaller step downs. Uh, and in the U.S., uh, as many may know, the U.S. EPA started in 2016 and 2017 with SNAP Rules 20 and 21 with implementing the start of some regulations around reducing uh, and, and not allowing high GWP refrigerants to be used in new applications in certain sectors 
uh, in order to encourage the start of an HFC phase down. Uh, as most of you know, those have been put on hold for a while, uh, but in the meantime, several states in the U.S. have moved forward with adopting those SNAP rules 20 and 21. So it's important to stay on top of what's going on, but all of those different mechanisms are being used you know, around the world uh, as governments decide best what will work for the uh, constituents that they have in their country. So hope that helps, Chuck, and uh, back to you. Okay, thanks so much, Stephanie, for going through that uh, level of detail for us. I, I know it's complicated, but I think that uh, will be useful moving forward. I guess to summarize, uh, you know, a number of points that I hear. One, HFCs are not going away. It's a phase down. They're going to be around, uh, although you, their use will be ramped down. It's not going to be a linear, uh, simple ramp down. Uh, for countries that have adopted uh, or ratified the Kigali Amendment and have uh, regulations underway, they have a number of options, uh, cap and reduction, specific uh, sector or application uh, rules, as well as service bans, uh, and a combination of those things. So it's going to be complicated, uh, and it's underway in a lot of countries, uh, Canada, and even in the U.S. where Kigali has not been ratified to date, uh, the states are moving forward with uh, a various uh, selection of these types of rules. So it's really important to keep all this on your radar. Uh, to that end, make sure you subscribe uh, and like uh, this video so you can stay uh, abreast and uh, catch future episodes. We'll be going into more detail as things progress. And as we learn more, we'll be sure to share that information. Thanks, as always, for checking out this episode of the Refrigerant Checkup. We'll be talking to you soon. So long.